Okay, the acrasia mycota. These are the cellular slime molds. Because they have a pseudoplasmodium. Pseudo is false. And it's almost become a common English word now. It's so, so much used in English. The main assimilative stage of these organisms are amoebae. And they are going to aggregate. That is, they're going to come together to form a pseudoplasmodium. And that is cellular. So there is a cellular ag there's an aggregation of these free living cells, like the amoebae we just saw in the myxomycota. But now they're going to come together and not fuse. They're going to come together and kind of stick together in a multicellular mass. That's going to be something, not very much, but something like the plasmodium. And that's going to be the pseudoplasmodium. It's going to have a cellular structure. In the acrasiomycota, we have no flagella. There's the possibility, at least, of flagella in the myxomycota. It's not a really important part of their life cycles, but there is a possibility there. We have no flagella here. And there are, there are cellulose walls around the cells. So they're very thin cellulose walls, but there's a little bit of cellulose in those walls because they can still move like amoebae. <clears throat> the genus is Dictyostelium. And I'm pretty sure we've got at least one or two people in here who work in Dr. Steinle's lab, and you probably all know much more about this organism than I do. But this, so Dr. Steinle works on the proteins acted in myosin in particular that allow these cells of Dictyostelium to move like amoebae, to move in that amoeboid way. So will red show up? Yes, we're okay with red. So here are some of those amoebae and their characteristic no shape, no particular shape of these cells are a little bit hard to pick up. And they are called mixed amoebae. So they're called mixed amoebae in, in these cases. It's too hard to see. Thank you. Mix a maybe. Here they are again. We see two things here. First, there's the mix amoeba. And up in the right corner, we see part of the aggregation of those amoebae. So each of those cells, you can see, is moving very quickly. Now that's, of course, sped up. That's time lapse. <clears throat> and they're moving toward that tip of a micropipette. That micropipette is releasing cyclic AMP, which is the aggregation um, signal. So cyclic AMP is the aggregation signal that those things are forming. So when these things are going to aggregate to form the pseudoplasmodium, one of the cells will secrete, start secreting cyclic AMP, and all the others are going to move toward that cell and aggregate around it. And I've got some nice videos that will show that in a minute. 
Here's what happens when they aggregate. They form this pseudoplasmodium. And in English, that's also called the slug. So that's the slug. The slug, and here it is down here in light micrograph, it's very small. You don't get a sense of the scale here. Trying to think about how big that would be. A couple hundred micrometers, probably. Maybe as long as a millimeter. Mm, don't think they're a millimeter. You got an idea anyway. We're not talking about even two millimeters for this case. So they're very small. They are composed of cells. So there are, there are all individual cells in here. There's an aggregation of cells. So it is semi-multicellular. We say it's semi-multicellular because these cells were all living completely independently a short time ago before they aggregated. And now they aggregate into this kind of federation. This loose association of cells that functions as a unit for a short period of time. Now it functions as a unit long enough for the slug to undergo migration. And that's what this guy is doing. It's <coughs> migrating. So there's a short migration period. Now, when you're growing these things in a Petri dish, you know, the migration period or the migration distance can be on the order of a centimeter or two. So it's not a long migration. That's why these guys couldn't make it to Tokyo. <coughs> A centimeter or two. So they're but they're migrating, and then they're going to turn up, and that's what's starting to happen here. They stop, and the tip turns up, and they're going to form a sporangium, or technically, it's going to be called a sporophore. So this slug is undergoing sporophore, and I'll explain sporophore in just a second. It's like a sporangium. Sporophore formation. The different parts of the slug of the pseudoplasmodium are going to form different parts of the sporophore. <laughs> so this is this part, this tip, is actually going to form the stalk. This area here is going to form the spores. And this is the stalk and the base. So this thing is going to turn upwards, and the spores are kind of going to climb up it. Next slides are going to show this better. So here we have sporophore formation again. <coughs> here is the area where the spores are. Here's the stalk. And you can see that same thing here. Here are the spores. There's the stalk at the tip. And you kind of get the sense, I hope you get the sense, and we'll see it in a video, that those spores are kind of almost climbing up the stalk as it's, as the stalk is elongating. And there's a scale to give you how big that is. So the whole thing there is, you know, I was about right in the size between 100 and 200 micrometers, a tenth to two tenths of a millimeter. <clears throat> so that's the kind of thing I'd like you to be able to get out of the class from doing those measurements that when, when you've seen something, you can do an estimate like that. I don't want you, you don't need to know exactly what it is, but you should know, you know, this thing is not five millimeters long. It's not half a centimeter. Be able to get it in the right, kind of in the right scale of ideas. As, as I just did guessing at about the size of it from seeing it. So the question has arisen among molecular biologists is how this organism decides in the slug stage which cells get to be spores and which can be soft stalks. Because if you think about it, those cells which get to be spores, they 
are ones that are going to pass their DNA on to the next generation of amoebae. And the ones that get to be stalks, that's it. No DNA passed on. So how do they decide? How does the organism decide? Is this the prototypical example of altruism? Some cells sacrifice themselves, the stalk cells, in order that others might survive? Well, I don't know, but it certainly has raised interesting questions in molecular biology of what the molecular basis of those kinds of decisions, so to speak, are and how they are made. And it's an interesting organism for these kinds of questions because you see it's not really an organism. This isn't really a true multicellular organism. We're at something that can be used as a model for the beginning of multicellularity. Here's a little later stage in the formation of the spor sporophore. These are the spores. There's the tip of the stalk. Same thing over here. And this is what you would see under, this is what you're very likely going to see under the microscopes when you look at it next week in lab. You'll see those sporophores pretty much fully formed. Okay, so what's the difference between a sporophore and a sporangium? Here's a sporophore. And what you notice is that there is no sterile covering. No box. No angium. Right, so it's not a sporangium because there is no box that encloses the spores. The spores, when they're mature and are about to be shed, are just at, born at the top of this sterile stalk. So there's a special name for it. Now, even though this is the correct use of sporophore and sporangium, you will not find it consistently used. These terms are not consistently used any place that I've seen in the literature. And I think that's probably because no one told those poor scientists that they had to learn some Greek and Latin roots. So they don't really know what the words mean. So I'm not going to hold you to knowing the difference between sporangium and sporophore for this class because basically no scientist knows the difference either. But you should know. You should really know these words do not mean, sporophore really means, does not mean sporangium, even though I'm not going to ask you that on an exam. Everything we've been talking about has been the asexual cycle. So this is what we've been talking about of the organism. This is the sexual cycle. We'll come back to that in a minute. So there's the aggregation stage, the slug, the pseudoplasmodium. And this part here, this is the formation here, is called culmination. Again, we're not going to worry about that too much, but you see that term there, culmination. And there's the spore, there's the sporocarp. Sporophore, I'm doing it now. The sporophore. It's called sporocarp here, you see? No, no consistency. <clears throat> The sporophore. So the organism here in this stage, this is all haploid. So it is like the haploid stage of the myxomycota. Is that there? Remember the haploid stage of the myxomycota was unicellular. It's something like that stage. It is unlike the myxomycota in that here the main assimilative stage is unicellular. In the myxomycota, it's the plasmodium. It's that. It's not unicellular, it's not multicellular, it's the new structure, another new structure, the plasmo the pseudo the plasmodium, multicellular diploid nuclei structure. 
Let's look at some videos. Dr. Steinle, some years ago, was very kind enough to provide me with these videos. He did not take the videos, but I think he assembled them into a single presentation like this. And so these things were taken back, oh, I don't know, in the 60s or 70s. And so we're going to see the different stages in that asexual cycle now. So here's aggregation. And there you see the individual cells, organism over here, secreting cyclic AMP, and all the individual cells streaming towards it. Again, time lapse. And it's going to form a myxomoebe over there, or not a myxomoebe, a pseudoplasmodium over there. You'll see that again now, we're in a magnification where we don't see the individual cells. See, there it is going, clock, they do that counterclockwise in the Southern Hemisphere. That was a joke, another joke. You see, Miss Hush, brush words, come on. You gotta help them see out. <laughs> and there it is, forming that aggregation stage in there. So here's the slug that routes the results from that. Very small, again, time lapse. And then it's going to settle in just a second and undergo culmination, which means this, this sporophore is going to form. And there's the sporophore formation, and you can kind of see the spores, they almost look like they're climbing up that stalk. I guess they're not really climbing up the stalk as elongating, but it looks like they're climbing. I thought it did one more time. No, it didn't. That was it. Do you want to see it again? So I get, I get to tell the South Hemisphere joke again, and you laugh this time. <laughs> see, practice. That's what I like to see. I like to do that. <coughs> There's aggregation again with cyclic AMP. See, see so that little guy, this little guy over here zooms in last, don't forget me. There he goes. It's always a slow one. <coughs> So then I'm going to go through the migration phase and then settle down for culmination. And the formation is four or four. You notice that there's a bunch of those that are not forming correctly, but you can see that, and you'll see it on the petri dishes, that there's a lot of genetic variability in the formation of these things, so that some of them are going to form nicely, and many of you that you'll see end up like these over here or over here. They're bent over, or there's something happened in their formation that put them kind of abnormal. They wouldn't shed their spores well. So the sexual phase. So here's the, we're in the haploid phase here. We have the haploid myxomoebae. And they are going to fuse in a very unusual and strange way. And I really wish it was the end of October now, although I'm getting old enough not to wish away any more time. But that would be the perfect time to talk about this process that we're going to learn about now 
because this is one of the few organisms that has true cannibalism. Cannibalism. So mix amoebae. So what happens here? We get fusion, first of all, to form a zygote. And that zygote then, here's our zygote. has a diploid nucleus. Now I'm going to draw our haploid mixamoebae in another color, in blue. Just to remind you, here's our blue mixamoebae. And that haploid nucleus now begins to secrete, secrete, something like secrete, cyclic AMP. And so it becomes an aggregation center again for the mixamoebae, and it engulfs <coughs> mm -hmm. the diploid nucleus secretes the cyclic AMP, and so we in, it engulfs the haploid mixamoebae. So our macrocyst then consists of those that diploid nucleus, the central diploid nucleus, surrounded by lots of mixamoebae and in the formation of the macrocyst we then get cannibalism. Okay, you know I'm kidding about the cannibalism, but it's, it really is just like cannibals. They eat the cells. The diploid nucleus, the diploid cell is going to ingest those mixamoebae. So it provides a food resource then for the formation of that diploid macrocyst. And it becomes, there's only a single nucleus at the, in the macrocyst stage. One diploid nucleus. It's the only diploid cell in the organism, the only true diploid cell, this process of forming the macrocyst. Gosh, I don't know what you call that. Diploid and haploid. A little haploid food mixed in with a diploid nucleus. But anyway, it ends up with a single diploid nucleus, a single diploid cell, and that is where meiosis is going to take place to produce, again, our haploid mixamoebae which then undergo the full process that we showed before of cell division, formation of the slug, formation of the sporangiophore. <coughs> so Thank for you. the point list, the macrocyst would put two N plus N? There's C3, thinking ahead. <laughs> yes, macrocyst would probably, and two N slash N probably, something like that. Yep. Indicate that both kinds of nuclei are in there. For the early, that would be the macrocyst before it goes into this, the early macrocyst, macrocyst formation. The macrocyst itself really is diploid when it's in the resting stage. It's already assimilated, it's already taken in those haploid cells, digested them. Yeah, so after karyogamy before meiosis, we would have a diploid macrocyst resting stage. Here are the stages of dictostelium <coughs> macrocyst formation. So here is the young macrocyst. It's not easy to tell where the diploid nucleus is in there. I'm just going to make up the fact that that's it. And then surrounding it, we have the haploid mixamoebae. The same thing over here. On the first diagram we have the young macrocyst.
and then the mature macrocyst. Can you see that? No. And there would be, in that mature macrocyst, this, this lower one is really the better example, we have a single diploid nucleus. Meiosis occurs. You can see part of that meiosis. And here are our mixamoebae, haploid mixamoebae. being released. So mixamoebae are released then from the macrocyst after meiosis. <coughs> On the left, we just see a nicer picture of that same thing. So essentially what we're looking at is this over here. So there are, I'm gonna have to use white here. There's a diploid nucleus in there someplace surrounded by lots of haploid cells, the haploid mixamoebae. A very nice image on the side. Shows about better on your computer than it does here. So with our example of cannibalism, we end our discussion of the mixomycota and the eucrasiomycota.